Happy Friday. Welcome to Project Echo Geriatrics. Um, very glad you're all joining us today. I know there'll be a few others joining us um, a little bit late. And, um, but we're, we have a fantastic speaker today, someone you recognize, Zach Markham, who is um, a, an expert in geriatric pharmacology. He's a pharmacist based over at UW Medical Center. Does a lot of research related to um, aging pharmacology, particularly things such as fall prevention. And he's gonna talk to us today about the updated beers criteria, which is um, something a lot of you are familiar with, I imagine. How many of you are familiar with the beers criteria? Good, I see quite a few hands. And if you're not already, you will be today. But it was just updated. This is hot off the presses, and Zach is going to give us the latest updates. So, like Kate said, I'm going to talk about the new AGS beers criteria update. Um, and they were just released on January 31st. So this is the tweet, the exciting tweet announcing their release. And um, Kate asked how many of you are familiar with the beers criteria, but has anybody had a chance to review the update yet? Just want to know. Okay, so this will truly be an update. Um, that's great. So in the brief time we have today, I'm gonna to cover some of the highlights of the update. I'm not gonna cover everything. And then we'll talk about um, how the criteria can be used in clinical practice, and importantly, how they can be used to educate other members of the healthcare team. So for those of you who aren't aware, the Beers criteria are named after a geriatrician, Mark Beers, who um, created them during his fellowship, his geriatric fellowship in 1991. And they were originally focused on older adults in long-term care settings. And since then, they've been applied to older adults across care settings, with the exception of hospice and palliative care. So why do we care about inappropriate medication use? Um, basically, it's associated with every bad health outcome that we're trying to prevent and avoid. So it increases mortality, morbidity, and risk of ADEs. Subsequently, it increased healthcare costs and utilization. We know that our demographics are shifting toward an older um, demographic, and along with that, comes increasing use of inappropriate medication use. Um, it's important that although it's common, there are often things we can do to prevent inappropriate medication use and minimize the risk in older adults. So the five types of criteria that are included in the Beers criteria are listed here. So the first main table, which is probably what we're all most familiar with, are medications that are potentially inappropriate in most older adults. Then there is another table that we commonly refer to as drug disease interactions. So for example, in someone with heart failure, you would want to try to avoid drugs X, Y, and Z. There's also a table of drugs to use with caution, which is kind of a holding area for drugs where either they're new on the market or the evidence is kind of evolving. And so routinely you'll see a lot of movement um, across one update to the next of drugs moving in and out of this table. In addition, we have drug-drug interactions and drug dose adjustment based on kidney function. So we're starting to get um, quite extensive tables and criteria that are enveloped in the Beers criteria over the past couple updates. In addition to those tables, um, there's one table that includes specific anticholinergic drugs because you'll find anticholinergics as problematic drugs across many of the criteria. And so you may ask yourself, well, which drugs are we talking about? and you can go to table seven and find which drugs those are. Um, for the update, I've, I wanted to focus on these three tables here, and they made it nice and easy for us. Um, so there's a table that um, lists those, those criteria that were removed since the last update, those that were added, and those that were modified. And so we'll walk through some of the key highlights of each of these. And um, I shared the, the article with Amy, and, and she'll forward that to the group. So if you have a chance, to review the new beers criteria, um, I would recommend you do that just to kind of familiarize yourself with these. So what was removed since the last update? So this criteria here of medications that lower seizure threshold in older adults with chronic seizures, that was removed really in an attempt to streamline the criteria to focus on considerations that are unique to older adults. And this one, while important, is not necessarily unique to older adults. In addition, in the past, there was a criteria to avoid H2 blockers in older adults with dementia. And so the committee decided upon re-reviewing the evidence that the evidence was quite weak. And then also in the presence of a concomitant criterion that says that we should be avoiding PPI use, they thought that they needed to remove this so that 
you know, an older adult with dementia who has GERD or similar issues could have something um, to be treated with. So that was one that's been removed. And then finally, um, aripiprazole was listed as an antipsychotic that was acceptable in older adults with Parkinson's disease in the previous criteria, but now that's been removed. And so where does that leave us? It leaves us with three recommended antipsychotics in PD, clozapine, hemavanserin, and quetiapine. And although these drugs are by no means safe to use in people with PD, um, they're the preferred ones. And the evidence for this um, is quite weak, just keeping that in mind. So now shifting to the criteria that were added. So if you recall, gliburide has always been the sulfonylurea that we come down hard on um, because of its risk of prolonged hypoglycemia. Um, now joining that group is glimepiride. So now we have um, those two commonly used sulfonylureas as drugs to avoid which really leaves us with glipizide as the preferred sulfonylurea in older adults. This is probably um, one of the most challenging additions. So now we have SNRIs as medications to avoid in people with a history of falls or fractures. And if you recall from the previous criteria, SSRIs are also included. And so now we're in a problem situation where you, know, you have an older adult with a history of falls or fractures who also has depression which is a risk factor for falling. And so it's kind of a tricky situation. And this is really an area of conflict between patient-centered care and quality measurement. Um, and it's, it's one that we um, will have to navigate carefully. For the table of drugs to use with caution, rivaroxaban has been added. In particular, this is due to an increased risk of GI bleeding relative to some of the other oral anticoagulants. And in particular, in older adults 75 years of age and above. Tramadol is now on this list due to its risk of SIADH and hyponatremia. Dextromethorphan and quinidine, which is a combination product um, called Nudexta, indicated for pseudobulbar affect, um, was beginning to be used in dementia for behavioral symptoms. And the Beers criteria say that this should be used with caution in that context due to limited efficacy, increased risk of falls, and increased risk of drug-drug interactions. Um, because both of these drugs have some serious um, metabolism activity in the liver that can lead to these drug-drug interactions. And then another um, drug that should be used with caution, it's probably something that's already on your radar, is Bactrim in patients with reduced kidney function in combination with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And that's really kind of a perfect storm for hyperkalemia. So those were the two um, the first two tables, this is the third table and it's focused on the modifications that have occurred. So sliding scale insulin has um, consistently been on the Beers criteria and also consistently been an area of confusion for a lot of people. So they've really just kind of clarified what they mean. And what they mean is that um, you should avoid insulin regimens that include only short or rapid acting insulin in the sense of a sliding scale um, regimen um, without basal or long acting insulin. So you don't wanna only use sliding scale insulin. Um, and this of course is due to the high risk of hypoglycemia with a lack of benefit in managing um, glucose control. And then another modification that occurred was the use of aspirin for primary prevention. So in the previous criteria, the age cut point was 80 and above, and now they've lowered that to 70 and above for primary prevention. And this is due to a lack of a net benefit so the risk of bleeding outweighs the risk of cardiovascular protection for primary prevention. So this does not apply to secondary prevention. And since these criteria were um, published, the ESPRI trial came out kind of consistent with this as well. So in the last criteria, and again this time, they've published this editorial that um, is kind of general recommendations on how to properly use the Beers criteria. And so I think these are always important to keep in mind. So these drugs are potentially inappropriate, not definitely inappropriate. You want to read the rationale and the recommendations, understand why the medications are included. Um, you're always wanting to think about safer, both farm and non-farm um, therapies. These criteria should be a starting point. It's not the end-all be-all. Um, inappropriate prescribing is just one part of safe medication use in older adults, um, particularly for health insurance companies, um, the Beers criteria should not be used in a punitive uh, manner to overly restrict due to prior authorization and the like. Um, and then finally, these are American criteria. Other countries 
Um, and Europe, for example, has their own called the start and the stop criteria. So you, I'm sure, are familiar with many of these challenges. Um, sometimes you have other healthcare team members or family members requesting drugs on this list for various reasons. Like I mentioned with the SNRI criteria in patients with a history of falls or fractures, there's this tension between quality measurement and patient-centered care. Um, while the non-farm literature is small and growing, we still don't know a lot about um, offering non-farm recommendations. And then, you know, to, in order to even begin this process, you need to have an up-to-date medication list. And so medication reconciliation, as we all know, is extremely challenging due to a variety of reasons, including the use of multiple prescribers and pharmacies. And interestingly, sometimes the risk of the drug is actually less than the risk of the condition. Um, so for example, using an antidepressant in a patient with severe depression and a history of falls or fractures, you know, the risk of using the antidepressant might actually be less than the potential for the exacerbation of depression. So you can use the BEARS criteria as a warning light to stop and ask yourself and others, why is the patient taking the drug? Is it truly needed? Are there safer and more effective alternatives? And does the patient in front of me have particular characteristics that either increase or decrease their risk of their medication? Um, and this should be, of course, done um, on a continual basis. Um, any new symptom in an older adult should uh, medication should come to the top of your mind first. And there's a lot of prescribing inertia that takes place with some of these drugs. So a specialist might start one and then the, the primary provider might kind of defer. And so I think it, I would just encourage all of us to begin asking these questions um, amongst our colleagues of why is the patient on it and do they still need to be on it? So in summary, the, this update provided nearly 70 modifications to the previous update. And because the AGS has taken on this task of updating these criteria on a routine basis, which is about every three years, at this point, the changes are more fine tuning. There's nothing quite too drastic taking place. Um, and they're just kind of updating the, the strength of the evidence and the strength of the recommendations based on any new research that comes out. Um, so I've not covered all of the updates, but these are just some of the highlights that I found when I re reviewed it for the first time. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around the updates as well. So. Um, this will be an ongoing discussion and we'll all figure out how to work best with these. So are there any comments or questions at this point?